forward. I don't mind Homestuck itself, but I hate the fandom. Terry is sitting in the bathtub, naked. The bathtub is filled almost halfway with what we later found out to be 70% alcohol and Sharpie dye. Bottles and Sharpies everywhere. It's all over the walls, on the tile, on almost all the towels, on several articles of clothing, and bags in the bathroom. What does she say? I was gonna clean it up. I'm one of the people who jumped in the pool, but I was there to my, witness it. My friend was in the room with the bathtub sharp. <gasps> Yeah. So that's a true shout story. Out, shout out to April. She's awesome. That's um, a true story? They, they yeah, had that's it. Oh, that's true. The... She was in that room. What? She wasn't the one who did it, but she was in that room, and she was like, I gotta go. She walked in, and she saw it. It was like a crime scene. She walked in, and she was like, what? Like, you know that, that gif of Abe Simpson from The Simpsons where he walks in, and then yeah, just yeah, immediately yeah. walks out the door? Was there like goes that. my deposit. Yeah, yep, whoop. Yep, she's yep. gotta go. And wow. so, yeah, but she was in that room. So that really was a true that story. That really That happened. wasn't just a myth. No, that really happened. Holy crap. Yeah, that really happened. I know so. they had when we... So, via a recent reblog, I found out that the story of my friend's hotel room had circulated far and wide across the internet. May I just say that this story is completely true, and I was there to witness the bathroom. To clarify, it was one of those situations where my friend needed people in her room desperately because people had dropped out and we all know how expensive hotels were. They had known the girl from a prior convention, and of course she seemed sane enough, but things just went progressively downhill as the convention went on. I was called about the situation and dropped by my friend's hotel as they were moving stuff out. The whole hotel room reeked of Sharpies and alcohol. If you are in the Homestuck fan community, you've all heard this story. Most likely condensed into two words. Sharpie bath. The story is likely the single most prominent story to emerge from the fandom, even beyond the Cascade Newgrounds crash or the Toblerone cave incident. But did it really happen? There's an old adage on the internet that is invoked to express skepticism towards unlikely events. Picks or it didn't happen. My goal when I began this project was to discover such photographs, or failing that, the person who was in the bathtub of legend. I have several leads. First, the most solid lead, the original Tumblr post. More specifically, the remaining Tumblr post. So, via a recent reblog, I found out that the story of my friend's hotel room had circulated far and wide across the internet. May I just say that this story is completely true, and I was there to witness the bathroom. The post was made on CGL, but neither of us circulated it back to Tumblr, because we tend to not want to connect the two sites. I'll repost the story and then go into details after. The story goes, as posted by my friend and experienced firsthand. Room with friends for Anime Expo. They have a few stranglers to make up for last-minute dropouts in the room. They don't know one of the girls too well, but they need the money. We'll call her... Terry. We get to the con Friday night, and Terry is almost three hours late. This wouldn't have mattered, but we had to pay that check-in, and she still hadn't paid yet. Get settled in. She throws her stuff all over the room, and proceeds to start yakking about her favorite thing. Homestuck. A forward... I don't mind Homestuck itself, but I hate the fandom. Saturday rolls around. Terry is cosplaying a troll from Homestuck, the one with the red eyes and the Libra symbol. She locks herself in the bathroom. I need to get into my troll makeup. Don't come in. Two hours later, she still isn't done. There are two people in the room with Trinity blood costumes, and myself and my friend have makeup that takes at least an hour to apply. Plus, we still need to shower. Not that our costumes automatically take priority, but two hours. Really? Door is locked, and she won't let us in. Fifteen minutes later, we start to get really suspicious. Friend decides to shimmy open the door. Her purse and valuables are in there, and she needs to go. Get door open. Terry is sitting in the bathtub, naked. 
the bathtub is filled almost halfway with what we later found was 70% alcohol and Sharpie dye. Bottles and Sharpies everywhere. It's all over the walls, on the tiles, on almost all of the towels, on several articles of clothing and bags in the room. What does she say? I was gonna clean it up. Bitch, you tried to dye yourself gray in a bathtub. We kick her out of the room. She pays $700 in damage fees, then she gets skin poisoning and damage from her stupid stunt. Fucking Homestuck fans. That's the story as was posted. To clarify, it was one of those situations where my friend needed people in her room desperately because people had dropped out and we all know how expensive hotels were. They had known the girl from a prior convention and of course she seemed sane enough, but things just went progressively downhill as the convention went on. People have been saying that one can't get ink poisoning from Sharpies, and while you actually can, the other thing was that she used a mix of Sharpies and 70% alcohol to dye herself in. Along with alcohol poisoning, overexposure to the substances combined can produce various negative effects on the body. I was called about the situation and dropped by my friend's hotel as they were moving stuff out. The whole hotel room reeked of Sharpies and alcohol. There were handprints and streaks of gray slash black Sharpie residue everywhere, and they'd kept Terry there to take down to the hotel staff to report the incident and have her pay for the damages. So, yeah, that's the story. It happened. I'll try to dig up the picture of the hotel bathroom if I can find it to post, because, damn, shit was redonk. The moral of the story is to not be such a fucking idiot and think before you act. April out. There are a couple things about the original Tumblr post that Phantom Shadows makes. First of all, it makes reference to a different Tumblr post and a link. The link redirects to the deactivated leg disabled Tumblr account. There are snapshots of this account on the Internet Archive, but even the earliest snapshot from 2017 is a dead link. This link undoubtedly redirects to the original Sharpie Bath post from 4chan's CGL board, the cosplay board. The date on Phantom Shadow's original post is March 9th, 2012, though due to Tumblr's lack of universal timestamps, this is sort of up in the air. Phantom Shadow signs her posts as April and is almost certainly the friend Octopimp referred to in the earlier clip. That's a true story. Shout out to April. She's awesome. There are a number of other posts recapping the events, such as from Actually Vriska, but these are usually retellings, and there's no new material involved in them. So right now we have two accounts of the story, both of whom allege to have been present for the actual event. One of these accounts is vouched for by former fandom figure Octopimp. While convincing, personally I'm skeptical. April's account is commenting on an existing story. It would be very easy for someone to insert themselves into it. The most likely outcome is that this did happen in some shape or form, but the circumstances are exaggerated. Before I make a final conclusion though, let's chase these leads to the end of the line. Also, to be clear, uh, if anyone is listening who is involved in this story, I'm not trying to call your words into question, I'm more just looking for more evidence. Anyone watching, I have already asked these people about these accounts, so there's no need to, you know, chase them down for more information, especially Octopimp, who I'm sure receives a lot of emails in the first place. According to this post, the event allegedly occurred at Anime Expo. Going by the date on the Tumblr post, we can assume this occurred in 2012 or earlier, at the height of Homestuck convention popularity. I emailed Octopimp about the incident, as well as Los Angeles-adjacent James Roach of Hive Swap and Friendship fame, who claims to know about the event. Octopimp politely declined to comment, saying it is not his story to tell, which is reasonable. Uh, James had more to say to my direct message, and also made some public comments. It was in an old friend's hotel room, but I haven't had contact with them in years, so I wouldn't know where to start digging for information. I can relay the story as best I can. Cosplayers often overbook hotel rooms and will pack 10 to 15 bodies in a small space to save money. Sometimes you'll get a friend of a friend of a friend staying with you just to spread the bill a little thinner. This was the case for the Sharpie girl. They were so-and-so's friend who needed a place to stay last minute. 
For cosplayers, hotel rooms are usually just staging areas, so they really aren't there most of the time except for the big rushes to get ready early in the day. There is usually an ebb and flow to these things, and some sort of unspoken rules about not hogging what little accommodations, namely the bathroom slash mirror, there are. Someone noticed this girl they hardly knew was taking an extremely long time getting ready in the bathroom and wasn't answering when they knocked. The details muddy here because I do not remember exactly how they eventually made it in or how they found the girl because the story wasn't about the girl when it was being told to me. At the time, the idea of someone soaking in a bath of Sharpies to dye their skin was just an annoying detail. Typical cosplay weirdo shit. The story was framed sort of like, you guys will never believe the shit I had to deal with today, and more about the aftermath and the mess they made and the cleaning fees they had to pay because the room was in their name. Anyway, the story sort of reached this insane myth status because there was a rumor the girl had to go to the hospital because she soaked herself in rubbing alcohol and possibly went into shock. Again, when the story was told to me, it really wasn't about the girl, it was about the mess and the fees. I didn't hear about the hospitalization until later and cannot confirm if that part is true or not. I did visit the hotel room, but it was before the incident. I don't remember the girl because they would have been one of like 10 people I didn't really know in the room already, and all young people look the same to me. James's statement reiterates hotel overbooking, which was and is still common practice among convention goers. He also mentioned that at the time, the focus of the story wasn't the Sharpie bath itself, this element seemingly attached later on. Uh, before continuing, I want to make this clear. In looking into this event, it is not my intention to expose or draw unwanted attention to any of the figures involved. All parties will be referred to either by their own alias or by a pseudonym. Everything published in this video is posted with permission. Thank you. Tumblr and Twitter so far have only resulted in blurry evidence. The closest account from April is secondhand. Is this the end of the line? All of my DMs to other involved figures got either no response or the person's requested not to be quoted. There is, however, one final way to obtain information about this. If, like the post claims, the incident resulted in hotel fees. Still, finding record of these fees would be like trying to find hay in the needle factory. The hotels affiliated with Anime Expo are available online in a list, but there are several dozen, not including the many unaffiliated hotels in the area. Calling them all would surely be too much effort for a video about Homestuck, right? LA University Medical Center. For new reservations, touch one. For the sales department, regarding inquiries for group, catering, or meeting space, please touch two. For questions about your billing, touch three. To speak with a hotel representative, touch zero. Thank you for calling Hyatt House, L.A. University Medical Center. Please hold on while I try that extension. <laughs> Whoa. Hello, Dave. We're calling from Guest. It's Vanessa. How can I help you? Hello. Uh, my name is JoJo. I'm a journalist doing a piece on fan communities in the Los Angeles area, and your hotel was listed under Anime Expo's recommended accommodations. Uh, if you have a moment to speak, I have a few questions about Anime Expo and the culture surrounding it. Is that something you're familiar with? Uh, so, I'm sorry, I was just working in front desk. Uh, for the detailed information, would you mind like, email us, and then I can forward your email to the manager, and they can answer your question. Sure, uh, what, what is your email address? Uh, you can Hello, my name is Jojo. I'm a journalist doing a piece on fan communities in the LA area. Your hotel was listed under Anime Expo's recommended accommodation. If you have a moment to speak, I have a few questions about Anime Expo and the culture surrounding it. Is that something you're familiar with? Hello, my name is Jojo. I'm a journalist in the East Los Angeles area. Your hotel is listed under Anime Expo's recommendations. If you have a moment to speak, I have a few questions about Anime Expo and the culture surrounding it. Is that something you're familiar with? Sure. Thank you. 
I called 117 hotels. Of them, 57 responded, 18 gave me a statement, and just one gave me something usable as a soundbite. I remember seeing a lot of gray. Gray? Yes. Some, uh, that would probably be the gray face paint. Sadly, this effort was a total bust. If this happened in 2012, we're talking about a receipt from over a decade ago. I wish I could say something concrete turned up, but I did get material that will come up at a later time. So, in the evidence we have of the event that could be considered firsthand, in a word, it's tenuous. Even so, you may be willing to give the benefit of the doubt. After all, this isn't a court of law, it's just a shitty fucking YouTube video. Some of you out there might be willing to trust April's first-hand account. To put the nail in the coffin of this particular tale, let's explore the concrete claims of the two posts. Specifically, let's discuss the Sharpie bath itself. The first empirical detail mentioned is the bath E was in the room for two hours, then that the bath contained 70% alcohol. It's unclear if 70% refers to ABV or the proportion of the bathtub, but either way it can be assumed that the alcohol is the more impactful substance in this scenario. A quick note, there is a reason that Sharpies specifically are involved. There's a well-known technique for dyeing hair using rubbing alcohol and ink extracted from felt tip markers, and the Post's authors, or the Sharpie artist herself, were iterating on that technique. I hope this doesn't need to be said, but do not dye your hair or skin with Sharpie ink. According to the two Posts, there are three orders of events. One, the bathtub was 70% full of drinking alcohol. Two, the bathtub was 70% full of rubbing alcohol. And three, the bathtub was arbitrarily full of 70% or 140 proof alcohol. I think it's most likely that rubbing alcohol was used because 70% alcohol is a common phrase for rubbing alcohol, but it's unclear. Now we can do some extrapolation. The dimensions of the bathroom itself are not mentioned, but are an important factor in the dissipation of gases. Let's say the room was being shared on a budget like uh, James Roach talked about. If that's true, it's unlikely that the bathroom was large in size. The CGL post also mentions a smell, which lends credence to this being rubbing alcohol, but the Sharpie smell is very potent, as anyone who went to public school knows. The story mentions skin poisoning being a result of the incident, but it's unclear what this means specifically. Importantly, if this did result in injury, it's likely this would be part of the earlier story, but neither account includes anything about hospitalization or an ambulance ride or an injury beyond something vague. To give you a sense of the severity here, people have died in alcohol baths. This is very important to stress because you shouldn't do it, and also it means that there's something wrong with this story. Even vapors from rubbing alcohol, which is the more likely substance used in this story, can be fatal. Unlike the warnings of your elementary school teachers, permanent marker will not poison your skin as they are non-toxic. However, at larger quantities, such as the amount in a Sharpie bath, they might cause discomfort. On the other hand, alcohol is far more dangerous, particularly if the solution in the bath was rubbing alcohol. Even the fumes from common disinfectants like isopropyl can negatively affect the nerves and heart, according to medical news today. The danger of alcohol baths seems to me to be the biggest red flag in the truth of this story. The first account claims that the Sharpie culprit was in the bathroom for two hours. That is an excruciatingly long time to spend immersed in alcohol, rubbing, or drinking. This would have led to a medical emergency unquestionably. Furthermore, the average bathtub is approximately 80 gallons, so if it were filled entirely or even 70% with any alcohol substance, that would require the Sharpie culprit to have brought in inordinate amounts of alcohol to the hotel. Even if it was full of halfway, that's still 40 gallons of this stuff that she needed to bring. Now, you might be thinking, yes, it's unlikely that this story happened as written. What's far more likely is that someone made a mess in a hotel room, which isn't uncommon, and those around them blew it out of proportion. 
If that's the conclusion you come to, then I agree. But my question is, if this is just some ordinary convention story, who cares? The sensational element is the Sharpie bath. If there was no bath of Sharpies, the premise is gone. It collapses entirely. A big mess in a hotel room is a good story for you and your buddies, but I'm willing to call the story what it is. False. There was no Sharpie bath. If there was a Sharpie bath, it would have been a catastrophe, like a medical catastrophe that this woman it would have impact the rest of her life. And that is not mentioned anywhere in the story. All that's mentioned in the story is the $700 damages that they had to pay. It does not add up. After all this evidence, I'm left somewhat disappointed, mostly because there is no evidence. The story has been used as shorthand for why Homestuck fans are insane from the first post on the CGL board, and it boils down to some ordinary convention story from 2012. Doesn't that seem unfair? For this story in particular, there is an unusual willingness to believe in it. I'm not entirely sure why people believe this story to begin with. I think that it's fascinating how this one kind of flew under the radar. There's a lot of stories and copy pastas from this era of the internet that I would define as like the post like in shitification, but pre like real in shitification, like post in shitification, pre corporatization, where there was still this sort of forum culture and rampant skepticism that went around. And this emerged during that time, this, you know, time when people were coming from something awful to Tumblr, and people still believed it for no reason. And I don't really know why. It, it kind of pisses me off, because this is an idiotic story. I think it's idiotic. A lot of people seem to like it in this day and age, but I don't know. It, it just it doesn't make sense to me why this story, of all stories, would be the one that, you know, proliferated. It's just weird. And this, this project has been about getting to the bottom of that and trying to like find out why this fake ass did not happen ass story still has so many people who are willing to go to bat for it. In the Izzy's video, uh, they talk about like, you know, oh, I want to believe this. Personally, I like to believe that the story is true, but what about you guys? Do you guys think this is something that actually happened? It's like, why? Why do you want to believe that? It's a stupid fucking story about Homestucks. I don't, I don't know. I never understood the appeal. Uh, that's just me personally. There's obviously people who think this story is fucking hilarious, obviously. Otherwise, it wouldn't have proliferated as much, but that's just my take. On Twitter, I ran a poll where 66.2% of responses said they believe it, and even more said that they want to believe it in the replies. At the end of everything, the Sharpie Bath story endures, even through the people who it has been used to slander. I can sit here all day and debunk this story, but the story is beyond truth. It has achieved meta-truth. What is truth? I'm serious, we're going there. We're, we're fucking going there, folks. Uh, truth is easy to ascertain. If there's no evidence, you can still kind of come to a reasonable conclusion based on probability and things like that. Meta-truth, which is a word I just invented, it, some philosopher probably came up with a word for what I'm describing, but I'm gonna call it meta-truth. It's something more subjective and quixotic than just regular truth. Many times in your life, you'll find that untrue things still ring true, no matter if they've happened or not. Many works of fiction like dystopias or fantasy books utilize this meta-truth where they feel real in spite of their fictitiousness. Often, these stories will symbolize or epitomize something broad and difficult to directly point to, like social woes or systemic issues. These could be good or bad. Meta-truth could be compared to religious faith, but it could also be tied to blind adherence to cults or conspiracy theories. As I hope I've demonstrated, the Sharpie Bath story, while untrue, could be considered meta-true for this reason. It epitomizes the reputation of the Homestuck convention-going community. Still, meta-truth can also be ascertained. It's useless to debunk the original story, 
but can the greater truth be tested? To do this requires a broader investigation. Now we aren't asking if the story is true as it happened, but if the truth that it scaffolds holds water, the meta-truth in question being this notion that the Homestuck fans are unhinged. There are other fandom horror stories about Homestuck and their chicanery, such as the often repeated adage, seal your body paint, said because of gray body paint's tendency to be rubbed off on just about everything. In the Sharpie Bath's original CGL post, the screed ends with fucking Homestuck's man, and the original poster earlier laments that he doesn't mind Homestuck but hates its fans, which is a sentiment echoed today for other fandoms like My Little Pony, Steven Universe, Rick and Morty. The tone is Homestuck fan critical. The question is, were Homestucks really so bad? I only started attending conventions in 2015, but I'm far from the only convention attendee. The question is difficult to ascertain. If you ask people at the time, they may have these hyperbolic stories that they're willing to exaggerate. There aren't a lot of accounts from people who are impartial but also related. Hello? Hello? Hello. Uh, my name is Jojo. I'm doing a piece on convention culture in the L.A. area. I read that your hotel was a host for uh, Anime Expo this past year. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, I wanted to ask a few questions about the attendees. Are, are you familiar with any of that? I am. How did the Anime Expo guests usually treat your facilities? <laughs> um, I'll be honest. I've never been to an anime convention before or like, a fan convention in general, so I, I have no idea what the atmosphere is like in the slightest. Okay, so you, were, were any of the the Anime Expo guests any more or less rowdy than any other guests from other events, or did you notice any difference? No, I did not. Like, do you notice when fan conventions are in town at your establishment versus, you know, just regular business operations? Yes, I did. Uh, would you care to elaborate on that? Like costumes and whatnot? Not really. Fair enough. I, I know. I know you guys gotta, you know, keep a uh, a lid on the PR stuff. Are you familiar with the home uh, the Homestuck fandom in any way? And if so, do you remember any particular events or issues related to them? I remember seeing a lot of gray. Gray. Yes. Some uh, that would probably be the gray face paint and whatnot. D did you remember any like problems related to the paint, or was it just something you saw like on people? I remember having a hard time getting it out of bed sheets. Well, it's good to know that those homestucks are still getting laid in this day and age. <laughs> All right, thanks for being a good sport. I'll see you next time. <laughs> Is there anything else I can help you with today? <laughs> uh, no, I, th I think you answered all my questions. I really appreciate it. <laughs> Have a good day. I love you. Ultimately, we can't go back in time to know for sure, but Homestucks are unusually willing to go along with these stories themselves. If you're in the fan community, you've likely seen people on social media self-identifying as annoying fans and disparaging Homestuck in general. No one seems to dislike Homestuck fans more than Homestuck fans. This is common for other fan groups too, particularly ones where the source material doesn't measure up to fan expectations like Sherlock or Voltron. But why Homestuck? It seems counterintuitive that the strongest haters would come from within these fandoms. According to Arcadia.edu, self-depreciation often takes the form of humor and emerges from monitoring your surroundings to see if you're being accepted or not. In person, this self-monitoring is as easy as seeing others' body language or hearing their words. But on the internet where there is no body language, as well as the potential for innumerable silent spectators, this process is more difficult. Humans tend to focus on shame and weakness as a defense mechanism, and on the web, without positive reinforcement, we feel overexposed. This results in us hedging our bets, as it were, using our self-depreciation to attempt to lessen or disclaim others' perceived distaste. On a large scale, this means normalizing self-depreciation within a whole community or fan community. 
Self-depreciation is not ideal for two reasons, internal and external. Externally, self-depreciation gives others instructions on how to treat you. On a large scale, externally, it reinforces existing bad ideas about the fan community and discourages outsiders from getting closer. The internal reason self-depreciation can become maladaptive is how it can decrease self-esteem. A reversal of fake it till you make it. If you fake being down on yourself, eventually you just begin to be down on yourself. On a community scale, this usually takes the form of fans who are dogmatic about how terrible their work is. Examples of this are easy to find in the Homestuck community, in discords on Twitter, and especially on Tumblr. Homestuck, after its end in 2016, has turned from a cult following into a fandom that people used to be into, moreover something that is understood as cringe in some way. The comments on the recent Requiem Cafe panel that I clipped earlier reflect this, with people being shocked that there are Homestuck fans in current year. What is the cumulative effect of this? It's a fan community who are happy to accept far-fetched tales about Sharpie Bats to affirm their own confirmation bias about their own horribleness. That sounds pretty bad. Most of the people who want to believe in the story most likely bear no ill will towards Homestuck nor the fan community, but ask yourself this. Why is this the fandom story? The Sharpie Bath dying harkens back to a past that largely seems to be either niche or non-existent. Specifically, the Sharpie Bath story isn't about THE fandom, it's about convention goers in the early 2010s, neither modern nor universal. The number of fans from that era is ever dwindling, and fewer still attended cons. The question is, why does this story resonate? What truth is it speaking to? Is it speaking to any truth at all? There is no truth to the Sharpie story itself. This is not how most fans act in Homestuck or outside it. Even if the Sharpie story is true unconditionally, the actions of one maniac do not necessarily blend into the rest of us. Homestuck fans are responsible for thoughtful and passionate fan works, from fan comics like Vast Error and Desynced to artists like James Roach and Zamag. Undertale and Deltarune, two of the most influential indie games, were developed by Toby Fox, the former allegedly programmed in Hussey's basement. If you're looking for more fan work, I have an entire series based on this, which is excellent for fan creators. The link is in the description. The tone of the Sharpie Bath story, especially the original that was posted on CGL, is, in a word, vindictive. It's vindictive towards Homestucks, and I find it a little alarming that we've allowed this story that is so vindictive in nature and so obviously false to shape so much of how we talk about Homestuck or what their reputation is. At the beginning of this section, I said, are Homestucks really that bad? And when I read this script to a friend, they said, oh yeah, they're totally that bad, as a reflex. And it's easy to have that reflex because there are so many fucking stories about maniacs at conventions, which I think are not true. The story is not true, and the story is not meta-true. I remember my first convention was in 2014 at uh, Shudokan, which was a, a local convention that, that was held in Lansing, Lansing, Michigan. And I went there, and I also went to Yomacon, and I remember seeing just a lot of Homestuck fan people. And I remember just feeling very welcomed by that. I don't know if that was just Yomacon or just Shudokan or whatever, uh, but I remember thinking these people are getting a lot of hate for some reason. And I've kind of had a chip on my shoulder ever since about this. This is kind of what that this whole video is, is getting at. I'll never forget this. Someone came up to me at the convention. I was dressed up like, I think it was Dave Strider, because I everyone, it, it's an easy first cosplay, right? The kids are very easy to be as your first cosplay. I was dressed as Dave Strider, had the aviators and everything. And this guy came up to me, and he was dressed as like a fucking Naruto character or some bullshit. And he was getting really confrontational. And if you've ever been to a con, you, you've had these sort of drive-by <laughs> these drive by uh, conflicts where someone will like walk by you and shout something that you don't entirely hear all the way. And he goes, he, he goes, why do you even like Homestuck, man? And he walked right by me. And I remember because I was a weird little confrontational fuck ass, I went up to him and I said, what do you mean? Like, what's the problem? 
What's the problem with Homestuck? And he just told me straight up, there's not even a show or anything. And that, that fascinated me. And I think outside, to outsiders looking in, it's very easy to be like, what the fuck is wrong with you? Why do you like Homestuck? That's idiotic. That's moronic. And uh, I, I think a lot of the hatred is from confusion. From a lot of convention goers being used to anime. Uh, I talk about Anime Expo in, the, in this video. And people are there to see like the anime characters that they like. And they see just this wave of Homestuck shit. And they don't know what the fuck it is. And I think that's very like alarming, especially because they're they're just not used to it. I think that has to do with like why Homestuck has the stigma it does. Now everything I've said in the previous section I believe to be true, but you might still not entirely feel complete about it. There's something missing, something at a deeper core. Something past the meta-truth that I've already discussed. A sort of cognitive dissonance, a voice at the back of your mind. It's saying, who cares? Who the, who the hell cares? Deeper than meta-truth, we have meta-meta-truth, which is another thing I just invented. It's the Ouroboros of reality as perceived by we, its constituent makers. As I hope I've established, Homestuck suffers from a reputation issue. That of being maligned for the behavior of hypothetical teens in the 2010s. The conclusion appears to be that this fan community has self-esteem issues stemming from an unshakable stigma. That's all true, but is it... true? Because at the end of the day, there's something I haven't said that is a vital part of this equation. The story's funny. The way I've discussed this story and the fan community has a flaw in it. I've debunked the story and, in some fashion, debunked the concept of the story's impact. But what happens after that? The Sharpie ink isn't going back into the pen. The genie is out of the bottle. I don't have the power to untell a story. And even if I did, I don't think I would. I don't think I should. The problem at the heart of things is this idea of fandom or what it means to be part of one. After the convention ends or when we log off, or even when we simply avert our attention, do we continue to be part of a fan community? The concept is rather silly when it's whittled to the bare nub of its meaning. Homestucks have a reputation, but can either thing be said to exist? In a less pretentious way, the Sharpie Bath story isn't true in its facts or in its symbolism, but it is true in our hearts. The story is true because we believe it, and it has constructed this illusory fandom that we can choose to attach to ourselves. If everyone agrees that Homestuck fans are Sharpie bath-taking maniacs, who are we to say no? Who are we to judge? All we can do is laugh at the silly story and move forward. Fandom is being constructed by its constituent makers, and influencing that truth is harder than identifying how much alcohol it would take to fill a bath and kill a teen in 2012. We on the internet love to talk about social constructs as if they are thoughtfully crafted or internally logical. And we do have the power to change them, but that power is inherently collective. And collective power isn't easy to sway. As singular participants, it is sometimes necessary to accept reality for what it is. Sometimes there's a story that has been constructed that you don't like. Sometimes people are attached to that narrative. There is no power in defeating these unpleasant stories, but there is power in telling your own, in replacing them. To phrase it another way, do you want to be part of a fan community that values drama from 2012, or do you want to be part of a fan community that uplifts its creators? Are they really mutually exclusive at all? One thing that surprised me about this project is how many people had different opinions on the Sharpie Bath story than I did. When I heard the Sharpie Bath story, it irritated me. It felt like slander about a topic that I was passionate about. To most, that isn't the read. To most, this story is iconic. It's funny. It's detached from their passion. They see this story from another angle, not as an attack on their character or of a fan community, but as a myth, a legend. 
It's reflexive. It happened because someone made a story about it. It became real the same way pagan gods and myths become real in that they're wholesale products of the collective unconscious. In my video, Homestuck and Religion, I made a similar point. Fan communities operate much like informal religions in that they begin to form the backbone of people's social experience. The Sharpie Bath myth is the result of this religionification of fan communities. Instead of believing truth, they believe in something. The main folly, then, is to assume that truth and belief are connected at all. All right, to summarize this bloviating essay into a single sentence, here it is. The Sharpie Bath story isn't true, but it does exist. Stories don't always need truth to exist and propagate, and this could be good or bad depending on which stories we propagate and why. This piece took considerable research to finish, and as usual, escaped the original plan I had for it. It just wouldn't be a Funk McLovin video if I didn't pry apart the philosophical concept of truth in the context of a video talking about an old webcomic. I do call the Sharpie Bath story false several times in this video, but I want to be specific here. I only call it false in that there seems to be no evidence. That could change in the future. So, I'm going to put my money where my mouth is. If you have a photo of this event with metadata and an additional piece of verifiable evidence like an Anime Expo ticket or hotel receipt, I will give you $500 and any one digital video game you want, no cap. This offer is open indefinitely, and my email is funkmclovinmusic at gmail.com. I'm not kidding. If you can prove this is real, I'll give you money. Here's a fun fact. I actually wrote this script, not on a word processor, but in this notebook that is from Torrid. Um, I think it, it's a pretty good format. Uh, it's a little bit harder to edit, and you could probably hear some page flippings when I... That's good ASMR. Page flippings when I was reading it, but that's, that's just a little thing about my process. Uh, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and uh, go to my Patreon. Give me money. I, I do love money, just like you. And uh, the Patreon will have some new blog updates, even for people who aren't uh, paying me money. So you can go there to get the blog updates or, or subscribe as a free fan. I don't really care. Um, also, another detail is I'm actually wearing a wizard robe right now. I, I thought that was important to share, because if you have a wizard robe, why would you not... Now, it's not a robe, it's a cloak. So the difference, I'll, I'll tell you this uh, to end out the video. The difference between a cloak and a robe is where it fastens and what it's for. A cloak is for, like, travel and warmth, because you can sort of stick your hands in there like this, and you can keep warm. This is actually pretty fucking warm, I won't lie. And it only costs 100 bucks. Anyway, a robe is fastened around the waist, Right now, we mostly have bathrobes, but there are also robes that, like, actual scholars used to wear. Anyway, there's your robe lore. Uh, my name's Funk McLovin. I hope you enjoyed the video, and I hope you enjoyed the, the SawCon Winter Showcase, if you haven't checked that out. And if you have, or if you're watching this in the future, uh, uh, that's it. I'll see you fuckers later. I won't see you at all. This is a parasocial relationship, bitch. Miles John also for the Zug plush. It's a great, it's a great investment.